bell differentiated rayon and uh, a cellulose. So this is actually some fibers that is isolated by um, uh, uh, Dr. Jan Lin's group back in um, HPU, and these are isolated from marine organisms. But the peaks that you are really looking, so the, 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 the information that I really want to um, uh, provide you is the peaks that we are really looking to differentiate out here are really small. So unless we collect a really great quality spectrum out here, you are not going to be able to differentiate out. So the, if there is a need, so like what we had discussed during um, the FTIR uh, library um, discussion is, yes, it's also very important to go really, really in depth and find the differences between such really uh, closely resemble materials so that the, uh, it's, it's not a misinterpretation when it comes to the final numbers. At the same time, we also want to do a very large picture of what is in and what's in not there, right? So, a, a, again, a really nice um, uh, data, uh, and I think uh, this one, um, Jen and uh, Jen's group has published or is or very close to publishing on the PNAs, so you'll see that one out as well. So this is a super interesting sample, um, and, and um, finding some of these things was actually the scariest. Um, again, it's a particle analysis. It's air samples, and actually last week this was accepted in science, so um, it's, it's going to be out pretty quick soon. So you'll see the full picture, and um, this was done in collaboration with um, Dr. Janice Barney at U Utah State University. So the, um, the particles that were collected is air samples, but these are collected in all the national parks. So they are analyzing how contaminated the national park samples are, or national park air is. Um, and um, we found some very, very interesting things in air samples in here, including uh, beads from um, paints. So I, I, I thought that's like, external paints and when folks add those acrylic beads to the external paints, that gets transported out all the way down to, so think about all the air currents that is taking it across, right? All, so they had predicted this, that the air currents can move this all across um, and through the national parks and they actually, when we ran these samples, we also saw these come up. So this was pretty, pretty nice. So. Uh, what we learned basically from all the four to five different studies is like, uh, these are like some of the studies which we did very closely where we have analyzed things way closer, um, is that there is definitely no one size fit all. So that means whether you analyze particles or fibers, you, you may need sometimes automated, you may need to do sometimes uh, individual analysis. And this part that the filters needs to be really pick very carefully is of utmost importance. So this is taking us forward to the next step of developing something better for, um, for um, the, the group that's here. And um, uh, so this silicone filter, or what we call the smart membranes, these were to developed actually as a result of understanding um, these um, uh, these type of like issues that we can get for both forces because um, we have both FTIR and Wellman, so we are looking at filter options basically that would help in both FTIR as well as Wellman. And um, these are called smart membranes. These are just silicon filters. These are 30 millimeter silicon filters. Um, they uh, they are sourced from a different company, uh, but they are turning out to be a fairly good option, but this is right now just as an option level. So again, this was developed just for this group. I mean, just because there was this need to look at uh, bottled water. There was this need to look at clean waters. Um, and so that's why this particular uh, filter was developed. But then these are all existing filters, which we also compare and contrast it. But what we are trying to also do is look at other options. So when I say other options is, we are working with um, a 
another uh, partner company of ours to look at filter options, and that is actually part of our uh, score augmentation study. So it is to basically find a very simple and easy way to screen water samples. So earlier there was discussion on using fluorescence, on using a lot of other technology to uh, screen water samples. Right? right now, the way it is, is like, if you have 100 gallons or whatever the, the protocol turns out, it's like, you will have individual filters. So going through all these individual filters and microscopy, uh, there may be positive ones where you may find one or two, there may be ones we may not find any. So what we want to help build is like a, a filter screen. So this would be like a filter so that you just push your sample through it. It goes through the sample, uh, goes through the filter and then you just put it on a regular bench top or even just like a portable FTIR that you will use tomorrow in lab and say pass. That means it did not detect any level of threshold of um, uh, microplastics in there. Or fail, that means it detected something in the thresholds. And we have done this for a lot of other industries. We do this routinely for oil and water analysis. So that's one of a very big application field for us is to because uh, how much oil is there in the water or when a, a water is getting out of a production line and so forth, people want to find out. So the same company that is uh, called OSS was helping us with those, uh, those uh, filters are helping us with this particular project as well. And uh, we are very preliminary, but the, the, the data look very promising. So, but right now uh, we have looked at a couple of the existing filter options but the study will help us to use a very controlled way to do this with multiple filters. So, and that is going to be like a pass fail. So once you see that it fails, that means you may have some particles in that filter. That gets picked out and that will go straight into the microscope. So you can then go in and identify it to the point level. So if five or 10 different filters you're doing and if you have only two to take to microscopy, because this will be a 30 second analysis or hardly a minute analysis, then you take it into microscopy and look at the extra data that you need to do. So that's one part of it. And then, uh, so that is where we want to build a filter that will work for basically an analysis directly on the small portable instrument. Remove it off, open it, put it in the um, microscope and get what's going on with these microscopes. So, Hopefully in six, next six to eight months, we are pretty hopeful. And, and, and with the standard samples that we will get to compare with the, um, the uh, scorps, um, clean samples, that clean water samples that we have been looking at with this, I think we'll get a very good idea of what kind of sensitivity levels we So that's where we are right now. We have options, but we don't know what kind of sensitivity levels we will be able to hit on, because that would be key for you. Because um, once, the, once you have like a target, like okay, 10 mg per ml, or whatever the number is coming out to be on the quant, for, for quant factor, uh, when the rules come out, that's what we want to hit. So will we be able to hit that or not, is what we want to see in the next six to eight months up there. So the other part is to have filters that are fairly inexpensive. So that also is also a result of all the feedbacks we have got working with um, all the different uh, users uh, here in the Bay Area, in, um, as well as in the East Coast, that the current filters, whether it's the gold, the aluminum, or anything like that, is expensive. It's not really good for a regular day-to-day -day use. So because if this big, once this becomes like a really a rule and everybody has to run like maybe 50 filters a day, that can be very, very pricey because the gold filters are like 30 bucks or 32 bucks or something like that. So uh, the others are not that inexpensive either. So the price factor is what we want to look at here. So we want to find a filter that would be appropriate um, for uh, this type of work, but at the same time, it, it's going to be very cost effective. We have certain candidates listed so far. Um, we, we have worked with a couple of research groups that have some very, very promising stuff that um, uh, I, I definitely
think we will not talk about it, but it's like they look super promising that most likely there will be some very inexpensive ways to uh, do that part as well. Um, so these are the two, hopefully in six to eight months, we should know much better um, where we reach with those two. But the next little story, this is very much compared, I mean, it's very similar to what you are doing and it's very similar. And this whole application, again, this was built uh, for that group of e-waste, or the electronic waste. And if, if you think about the electronic waste, it is almost predicted to reach like almost 120 million tons. One of the key things why the biggest companies in the world are interested in this is this last part, is the amount of gold that you have in a ton of e-waste is actually more than that is in the ore that you can get. That means there's a lot of precious metal that is there in the cell phones and the iPads and everything like that, that can be extracted out. And then everybody wants to be very, um, very conscious about what they put back into the environment. A big application now, this is for the particle size wizard as well as particle wizard analysis as well. But um, if you look at the analysis that we did, uh, it's almost uh, very similar. So um, what this is, is e-waste scrap. Very simple e-waste scrap, just in a bag. So I, we just pull out a couple of different particles out, just laid it down, it's just bulk particles. If you run them, it's what typical uh, stuff you can get. But what they want to do is, when you produce these e-waste, there's a lot of things that's coming out, including glass, epoxy, resins. Um, everything that's really, that can be really bad if it is just exposed out to somebody who's doing this type of work as well as if it reaches the environment. So a lot of big electronic companies are uh, keen on this part. But the solution for them is actually very similar to what you have. So actually this, I, I was able to do this because I knew what to do with the microplastics work. So this is one of those things, like, you know, you, you, you do one thing and you get, okay, if they want to study this, the, the key things they'll have to do is yeah, separate out the particles, like, just like you, you do. Um, this is like full circle going back and coming back to us. Separate out the particles and then go with the smaller particles separately on the microscope. So what you're looking at here is the particle size. So basically you're looking at around 250 particles and then the reports that you get. So each of this, uh, very tiny shown here, but it's different colors, it's different types of materials. So in when you do e-waste, one of the key things that we see is um, also glass, silica, as well as there will be a lot of metals. But then the rest of it are things that are very, very similar mm -hmm. to what you will be looking for. Because this is one of the bigger sources, right? Also may become one of the biggest sources. So it's good that they are giving a, a study on this like way ahead of it before it becomes a bigger problem. So, okay. But what I want to talk is, I mean, where we have pushed the technology, where we have pushed the technology. So, this is all the thing about polymers and how uh, the waste management and other folks can come together, learn from each other, and what we have learned, we bring it back to a lot of different um, fields. But this is something, um, uh, it, I mean, you all may have read about opioids. In news, you have heard about opioids, especially fentanyls, car fentanyls. These are like the, one of the most dangerous drugs that's out there. Um, so we were presented with a challenge and actually analyzing these in a lab is a huge challenge as well because um, these samples are very, very dangerous. So how would a analyst in a lab analyze these materials? So that was the challenge that was presented to us. And I should say I had like really two very brave counterparts in um, Albuquerque PD. Um, why I, they were so brave, I'll mention it to you because what we are looking at is why opioids are so bad, why it is so much of an issue is, is the potency of these things. 
So what we are looking at is a comparison of if this is morphine, a fentanyl or a carfentanil can be 100 to 10,000 times stronger than um, a morphine. So if a morphine can make a person just uh, like sleep, carfentanil and fentanyl can kill you. So it's like you can have one grain of fentanyl or carfentanil or anything like that um, in a sample, and if somebody touches it without knowing, um, it can actually cause accidental exposure. There had been report of a lot of accidental exposure when folks go into the field and um, do these type of work. So when this was presented to us um, um, two years ago, so what, what they wanted is uh, this, um, I mean, group of chemists, what they really want is a safe way to analyze it when these samples come to the lab. So usually FTIR is their go-to method for analysis because any forensic sample that comes into a forensic lab, they will first take it to an FTIR, run an ATR and get a spectra to do a match. This sample, you cannot do an open analysis. So if somebody even suspects that there could be carfentanil or fentanyl because they may be collecting it from a overdose site, how do you bring it to lab and analyze it? Not just analyze it, you have to separate it out into the individual parts so that you know what it is. So to do that, the biggest problem in the whole um, uh, drug world is actually a cat and mouse game. So what the street chemist would do very easily is they will create modifications, slight modifications on the main molecule. And uh, if you do a small modification, basically you can escape any kind of guilty word because in the, in what is they call the, in the law, they have to show which molecule it is and it should be there in the list of the unnecessary or unwanted molecules per se. But they will create small modifications, just add an edge, just add some changes so that um, you, they can actually evade uh, the law enforcement. So there was a need basically to have a library of these fentanyls which did not exist. And this library had to be created um, in a very safe uh, environment. So long story short, both infrared and Raman spectroscopy can be done for this. So earlier you heard about a lot of instrumentations working together. So we have an instrumentation, which is an FTIR, but it works also as a Raman. So what we did is we pushed the limits to use um, the same instrument to do both for these guys. But not, instead of doing a ATR, just where you openly analyze it, we worked with a manufacturer who had just introduced a um, fiber optic coupler or fiber optic cable which has a ATR tip on it. So now how can they analyze it? They can put this in a hood, so basically the analyst who's running it has no safety issue at all. Because before any of these can be gone into any further analysis into LC or PC or anything like that, they need to know how dangerous it is to handle these type of materials, right? So one way we handle it is with fiber optics at the ATR, FTIR levels. Then what we did is also did FT Raman on the same sample because FT Raman can work if your sample is inside even double bags or inside polythene bags by itself. So you have a white powder inside of, you can easily put it in the um, FT Raman instrument and you can analyze it. You don't have to take it out from the bag. So um, this is uh, a, Aquatronics is a uh, company based in Germany. They came out with this really nice, uh, diamond tip ATR probe. So <coughs> what it turned out to be is it's not just that it was a really good throughput for the range that we were looking for, but this um, gave really, and then you could work with it inside a glove box, so not exposing, uh, so the analyst doesn't have to expose themselves. Um, we got some really good data out from it. And I'll quickly go over, so just a um, couple of spectrums from heroin and cocaine and other things that were evaluated for this particular study. As well as what you're looking at here is a Raman spectrum of uh, fentanyl, carfentanyl, and things like that. These are inside bags. So now what they have is one instrument that will do two types of analysis at the same time, I mean, at one after the other, um, on the same set of samples, 
and give them double identification as they are required to do. So again, uh, this is what how we push the limits when there is a need that comes in. So this is it was a answer basically to somebody asked us to build a, a solution for them and um, we are able to do this by working with some of the other vendors around um, and, and create it for them. So this is the library that we had created. Uh, one of the nice things you can see is it can even differentiate between cis and trans um, fentanyl. So why these are important is these are just cis and trans isomers. So um, you cannot easily separate them out or identify them in mass spec as well. So if you, that's one of the bigger challenges most of these law enforcement do face. But if, with the FT Robin, you're just doing pretty easy, pretty nicely. Move forward to some of the other hyphenated techniques that may be um, useful for um, uh, the polymer world. So again, these um, the examples that I have picked are the ones that will be important, and a lot of the polymer scientists do this. So I think it's really important that you may want to learn this as well. And in the last couple of years, what you would see is yes, instrumentations uh, have refined itself, so IR instrumentations are way faster, have better sources, are, I mean, right now, most of the instruments that we sell, I think, gets warranted for like five to 10 years on most of the components in there. So things have gone better and better, but where's the next level, if you ask, is to combine techniques. For us, it's more to combine techniques to make, to, if you have a tiny bit of a sample, get more data out of it. So, uh, in this hyphenated techniques part, the first uh, little um, story I want to tell you is about TGA IR. Is anybody who's doing TGA at all here or has done TGAs? Awesome. So TGA is thermogravimetric analysis, a big, big part of polymer pose. They look at it for, um, uh, uh, the, the reason they look at it is if you have two polymers and one's a good one, one is a bad one, one of the easiest way to differentiate it out is just heat it up and see if it melts or if it's just um, uh, exactly the same or not. So we, if, what would happen is if you do take a small bit of this polymer sample or here the O-rings and put it in a pan and you just heat it up to very high de degree temperatures, so 800 to 1000 C, what you're going to look for is based on your temperature, you get a weight loss curve. If there is any additive that is added into this, this weight loss curve will be different. Great, so that's how most polymer uh, scientists were differentiating out polymer separately. But um, there are gases that are going to be released, right? If you heat up something and just disintegrate it, it will release gases. What we do is we take, we design have modules where we take the gas out from here bring it into the FTIR and analyze the gases because IR can see gases. What can that tell? If a molecule, when it broke down, if it is releasing the same type of species, that means it's the same material. If it releases two different types or different types of uh, materials, that means it's a different type of uh, gas release. So you can look at each of those species separately. And how much time do you have, five minutes? Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, one of the fun examples I should explain here is, uh, so this is what um, a lot of um, polymer industry and general analysis lab, labs would do called the environmental stress cracking investigations. So here, what they're trying to check is, um, so this is a cell phone cover. Why this cracked smoothly? So when, so, a manufacturer who was making cell phone covers got complaints from the field that their covers, uh, some certain people, it is breaking like this, but when they do it in their lab, it breaks like more rough edges. It's a very, very tricky question to answer why something like that would happen. But long story short, um, what was going on in these uh, uh, analysis when we run it through FTIR is that there were, uh, in, in, in the samples which were like nice and smoothly cracking, there were long chain um, like metal esters. So what is, 
basically what's going on is a lot of folks have a lot of hand cream on their hands, right? And hand creams tend to have a lot of nice methyl esters in them. So in polymers, a lot of polymers have nice pores, and these will um, it, take all these nice um, methyl esters go in, and this would cause the cracking to be way smoother than a rough edge cracking if you didn't use a, um, um, a hand lotion. So that was a fun thing to look at. So, and, and why um, this is important is um, you all will be looking at polymers. And polymers, one of the, if, if you come to a point where you are really trying to separate out a good polymer from a bad polymer, sometimes FTIR just by itself is not enough. You have to add it with some other technologies like TGA. Or the next example I may, I'll, I'll explain is that of, of GC. So um, I'm sure many of you do GCs here as well. A couple of yeses, yes. So the GCs, um, again, so you can see the FTIR can be combined. So what we do is we put a module right in there. We combine it with our GC and uh, you analyze the gases right there. Uh, where this comes in really handy, does anybody do GCMS? Couple of you, very good. In GCMS, one of the very difficult things to do is um, separation of isomers. But that's a very strong point for IR. Even though FTIR will be a lower sensitivity compared to a GCMS, but if you have isomers, it will separate it out really, really well. So just an example, uh, again, from forensic world, meth. So meth, you can have different uh, positional isomers um, and look at how well separated and how nicely you can look at this. Um, so where do you want to apply a GCIR to is where um, uh, you are stuck with <coughs> analyzing isomers or where you want to separate out two isomers that are very close to each other um, with other techniques. You can easily use GC GCIR to do this type of an analysis. The other one, or the last one, I should say, is um, geometry. So everything that we have around, um, I mean, if you have ketchup, if you have mayonnaise, if you have honey, anything like that gets analyzed on a rheometer because it's very important that the viscosity of these materials are very constant. So in this case, what we did is we combined a rheometer um, along with our FTIR and put a small ATR right up there. So what this helps in analyzing is the physical property as well as the chemical property changes of polymers, of adhesives, of everything like that at the same time. Um, so just as an example, basically if you had a acrylic glue curing that you were looking at, you can look at the uh, basically the IR changes, so which peaks are changing, as well as you can ch look at the viscosity changes of the same material. So you're characterizing physically and chemically the same material at the same time, and you are combining the data to get a better picture of what's going on. So that's um, the last combination technique. So anybody here does SEMs? Okay. A little bit. <laughs> so that's the other area that uh, uh, that we uh, we are combining the techniques with. Even though we do the analysis separately, but there's a lot of complementary information you can get, uh, especially when it comes to fibers. So especially when it comes to fibers, when you look at SEM pictures, you can get beautiful SEM pictures where you can see dark and light fibers and things like that. But then. If you also have the data from IR for those dark and light fibers, you have the chemistry as well as you have some really nice information uh, which is a high resolution image, just um, go hand in hand to provide you even better data. So, um, so the way the IR is going or the way the techniques in FTIR is going in the next couple of years or next five to 10 years, what I see growing with is Newer accessories, uh, so newer accessories is like, I mean, today I presented only the accessories that may be of any interest to you. In the last 
couple of years, we have developed accessories for very, very niche markets just because there was a need for it. Um, and uh, again, it, in the next few years, that's going to be a big thing uh, for uh, the microplastics world. I think coming out with some really good filters, coming out with a solution for like a pass-fail criteria or quick screening for water samples would be the, uh, the other thing. Yes, and in the process, the instruments gets refined, the, ins the softwares gets refined, and this is all coming back because there is a request or there is a need that's coming from uh, users and there is a need from to find these solutions. So this collaboration really, really works. It, it helps us make things way better, improve things way better, um, and develop things for you. Okay, I think that's, that's <laughs> it. I think I see your time. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much.